Okay, so today we're going to head towards the, the theorem of Pliny Burrell, which is, um, hopefully we'll, we'll, we'll finish the theorem of Pliny Burrell, which says what? What's the, what's the main part? What? Close and bounded subset of Euclidean space are compact. That's right, that's right. The compactness in Euclidean space is equivalent to being closed and bounded. So we're going to start off with um, one definition, which is not in the book, but, um, uh, but it's uh, a useful one. So um, we say uh, x is limit point compact if, um, if every infinite subset um, of X has a limit point in X. So every every infinite subset um, has a has a limit point in X. Okay, so that's called limit limit point complete. Um, uh, and so um, one of your theorems that you've read already is related to that. It says. Um, Suppose you have uh, a subset of some set K. <coughs> uh, if K is compact and E is infinite, um, then uh, E has a limit point. E has a limit point in K. Okay. In other words, um, using the vocabulary just introduced, compact compact implies limit point compact. <coughs> okay. So compact implies limit point compact. Right? If you're a compact set and there's an infinite subset subset of you, then that infinite subset has to have a limit point in, in K. Yeah, Maya. Isn't compactness defined with like fine, finite, sub, finite subsets, not infinite subsets? Uh, compact, remember, is is a sort of finiteness for infinite sets. Yeah. Right. So you've got these infinite. Your 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 set has infinite points in it. I mean, it doesn't have to, but the more interesting ones are when the sets when the points are infinite. Right. Uh -huh. Um. Right. So. So you've got, um, so what we're saying is that if you have some compact set, like, so secretly we know that, that this interval, this closed interval in R1 is going to be compact. If you have an infinite collection of points, so you've got an infinite collection of points in it, then you know that, <coughs> that somewhere there's going to be some, uh, there's going to be some limit point. That is, some point where every uh, punctured neighborhood contains some ele contains okay. elements of the set. Okay, so this is the picture you want to have. Okay. Yeah, Pam. Is a finite set limit point compact? Like, is there ever a set that a finite set could be limit point? Is it, the terminology is it used on finite sets? Right, so can, could you have a, could there be a limit set of a, limit point of a finite set? This was actually going to be one of your exam questions on Friday, but not anymore. <laughs> um, <laughs> but, um, uh, no. no, it's impossible, right? Because, um, right, because you have, you have a finite set, right, if you have a finite set, then, and I may, I should, I should give you, you know, points for coming up with the question that I was going to ask. Um, uh, uh, if you've got a finite set, how could you have a, remember that every limit point is going to have infinitely many members of the set inside, inside every neighborhood, right? <coughs> inside every punctured neighborhood. Well, if there's only finitely many points, then that's impossible. Yeah, but by definition, it says that you look at infinite subsets, but you don't have any. So is a finite set trivially limit point compact? Oh, uh, a finite set, do you call a finite set limit point, point compact? Yes, because it trivially satisfies the condition. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Um, okay. So, uh, so let's do the proof of this, right? 
And the proof is to say that, um, uh, suppose that, uh, that no point, <coughs> no point in K is a limit point of E. Okay. No point in K is a limit point of E. Okay. That means that for each, for each, uh, each point, uh, say Q in K, there exists a neighborhood um, V sub Q um, containing at most one point of E. Is that, is, that, is that clear? Mm -hmm. right. Is that clear? Right. Every, you've, got your, you've got your compact set Q, you've got your compact set K, you've got your infinite set, you've got your infinite set E, but no point of K is a limit point of E. Okay. So um, if I take a point that's already in E, it's not a limit point of E, so that means that I can find a punctured neighborhood that contains no other elements of E. Right? So that, that kind of that kind of neighborhood, that I'll call that my V V C right? And that neighborhood <coughs> contains one point of one guy in E. Okay? If I'm in if I choose a point that's not in E, right? I choose a point that's not in E, I call it N, say, um, that's not a limit point, so I know I can find a neighborhood in which there's no elements of E. Well that's got zero points of E. Okay? So every point in K, every point in K can be covered with some neighborhood that contains at most one point of E, right? It's either one or zero. Okay. Okay. Um, well then, uh, then uh, uh, cover cover K with the VQ. Cover K with the VQ, what am I going to say? By compactness, finite. there's going to be a finite subcover, right? By compactness, there exists VQ1 through VQ, VQN, such that K is contained in the union of those V, of those dots, VQI from I to 1 to N. Right? Right? But there are only at most n points of E in there in there. Right? Right? But then the cardinality of E is less than or equal to n. Right? Because each of the VQI contains at most one point of E, right? And there's n of them. So the cardinality is finite. <coughs> right? E was supposed to be infinite, but E turns out to be finite. Nice. Could you go through again how you know that there's that a VQ exists for every point in Q or for every point in K? Okay, okay. So that, that comes from this first thing here. So you got to understand, no point is a limit point. Okay. So if I take a point at E, it's not a limit point of E. Being not a limit point, remember, being a limit point means that every punctured neighborhood contains some ele some element of E. Being not a limit point means that there's some bad punctured neighborhood. So I choose that bad punctured neighborhood that's got nobody of E in it, right? Well, that my, my center was at E, but there's nobody in there. So that most of this guy contains one. Okay. If I choose some point that's not in E, I choose the bad neighborhood again, and I see that, well, there's nobody from E in there. So you, it's the bad neighborhood from not being a limit point. Yes? So that neighborhood only contains the point Q, right? Uh, no, it just contains, um, uh, it contains at most, most, most one point of E. It might contain other points of, of, of K that are not in E. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
we're not saying that it contains only one point, just at most one point of heat. Like, Still not sure what the relevance of at most one point is. Well, so we cover Q, we, we cover K with these VQs. Okay. Right? We cover K with these VQs. Okay. And then we say, okay, and each one contains at most one point of V. Okay, so at the beginning you're like, oh wow, there's infinitely many of these VQs. Well, you know, that doesn't that's nothing wrong with that. But then you remember that K is compact, mm -hmm. and so finitely many of the of the VQs cover K. Mm -hmm. Okay, finally many of the VQs cover K. Okay, so K is contained in the union of, of these of these VQs, VQRs, <coughs> right? But how many points of E are in the VQIs? Right, each one contains at most one. So there's, since there's n of them, there's at most n points of E. Right. Mm -hmm. That means that right, the guys, you know, E is inside of K. Well, K is contained in something that contains at most n points of E. So it's just finiteness. Yeah, so E has to be finite. Right? Okay. Okay, let's go on. Okay, let's go on. Okay, so compact implies limit, limit, limit point compact. Okay, so um, now we're going to do this, uh, this next theorem. Um, <coughs> let I sub n be a sequence of nested closed intervals in R1. Okay, so we have these intervals. Right, so there's i n, there's i n plus one, is is contained inside of i i n, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, so they're nested. Right, nested means that i n plus one is contained inside of i n for all n. Okay. Okay. Then the intersection of all the i n's is non empty. Is non empty. Okay. <coughs> okay. So this is related to what we did before. Remember that we had this theorem that said um, if uh, Compact sets have the finite intersection property, then their in infinite intersection uh, is not empty. Right? You remember that? We have the standard that says if you have a bunch of compact sets, and every time you intersect a finite subcollection of them, uh, you get something non empty, then when you intersect them all, it's also non empty. Okay, so this is kind of reminiscent of that, right? If we knew that these got, if, if we knew that closed, uh, these closed intervals were, um, and I should probably say closed and bounded, just to be safe. Yeah. Well, no, it's, I mean, it's okay either way, but let me just throw in bounded just to be safe. Okay, so if we knew that closed and bounded were compact to begin with, then we would just say, by the theorem, we're done, right? Right, because if we knew that these guys were, were compact, we just say, well, look, they satisfy the finite intersection property, so their infinite intersection will be non-empty, right? But we don't, we don't know that these are compact. We're gonna use this later to show that they are compact. So let's let's prove it that whenever you whenever you have these um, whenever you uh, you have a nested nested closed closed intervals, then the infinite intersection would always be always be non-empty. Okay. okay. 
Okay, so here's the proof. Okay, so let's notate um, I sub n <coughs> as A sub n, B sub n. Left end point, right end point. Okay. Um, and uh, notice that that since they're nested, you always have that um, A M is less than or equal to B M. Right? Well, this is just because you've got this interval, right? But you also know that the, any higher any higher interval is going to be contained inside here, right? So you have something like this, right? This is the this is the quality of being nested, right? That um, that this this m plus n interval lies inside the lies inside the nth interval. What we mean. This is what we mean by being being nested. Okay. Okay. So um, now uh, consider the set of all left endpoints. Consider the set of all left endpoints. Set of all left endpoints. Um, uh, it's bounded above. Right? It's bounded above by any of the by any of the Bs, right? By any of these. So so we know there exists a supremum of E. Call it So, um, right, this x is the supremum, right, it's the least upper bound of the ai, so we know that x is greater than or equal to ai for all i, right, since it's an upper bound, right, x is <coughs> an upper bound. So, we have that, um, but x is also, uh, but, um, and since uh, x is the least upper bound, we know that x is less than or equal to any of the bi, right? Because all the bi's are upper bounds. By construction, we 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 know that there's a least upper bound. We call it x. Oh, okay. 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 <clears throat> okay. So what does that show you? That shows that x lies between a i and b i for all i. In other words, x lies in every single interval. So. So x is in the in the intersection, right? So the intersection x lies in the intersection of all the i n. Like if you had an IN, that's the 
My professors, one, a, a friend of mine in graduate school said that they, he and a friend had um, bothered my advisor so much during the class. Like every, every statement that he made, they would point out you know, like imprecision in the statement. By the end of the course, he'd say, he would say things like, you know, well, let me see if I can state this actually, <laughs> if I can actually state a theorem properly. Uh, <laughs> um, but, um, yeah. Excuse me, you said trivially closed. Yes, yes. Okay. Yeah, because it contains all its limit points. There are no limit points. <laughs> yeah, so maybe maybe you uh, maybe you Bam can uh, can do that to me this semester. <laughs> <laughs> like make me so uncertain of myself that I cannot say anything up here. Okay. Um, okay, so, um, okay, and, okay, so we've shown, we've got this thing for, for, uh, for close and bounded non-empty intervals, and the same is, um, I'm, I'm not going to prove it because it's pretty straightforward, but there's a similar theorem for k sums. Okay, there's a similar theorem for k sums. Um, it's, it's easily proven from, from this thing. It's just a corollary of this thing. Okay. Okay, so let's get to uh, uh, what we need. The theorem that, in fact, all K cells are compact. Right? Okay. okay, so I'm gonna, um, just for simplicity, I'm going to do it for two cells, okay. so I can draw it on the board, but it's easy enough to do this in for k cells. Okay, so um, so <coughs> let I be a k cell, uh, a two cell. So it'll be um, uh, the product of intervals <coughs> a i b i from i equals one to k, k is two. So you've got this product of intervals, right? You've got, it's a, uh, uh, a rectangle, right? So you've got this rectangle, a i a one b one cross a two b two. Okay, that's my i. Okay, that's my that's my two cell, um, and let delta be uh, summation b i minus a i squared i from one to k. Right. I'm just going to write k, but you know k is 2. Um, everything to the 1 half. Right. So this is the, the length of the diagonal from one corner to the opposite corner of your, of your k cell. Okay. So in this guy, delta is, delta is the length of this. Okay. If it's a cube, you know, it's a parallel pipe from, from one corner to the opposing corner. Yeah, yeah. Uh, yes. Why should be shouldn't A be on the same axis? Or like, no, 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 no. So A I B I is is this one interval here? Oh, right? okay. I have the interval A I A one B one, and I'm crossing against the interval A two B two. Right, like the interval uh, one one. Uh, no, that's not the interval. Zero one cross say zero one. Right, that would give me the unit unit square. Okay, um, uh, then notice if x and y are in my in my uh, in my in my uh, cell, the distance between x and y is smaller than smaller than delta, right? The distance, the greatest distance is from one diagonal to the other, uh, is across the diagonal. So we're going to show uh, we're going to show that this thing is is compact by contradiction. Okay. 
So suppose I is not compact. Suppose I is not compact, right? So we're going to <coughs> proof by contradiction. Suppose I is not compact. Um, in that case, there's some bad cover, right? Uh, so there exists an open cover G alpha of I um, for which there is no there is no uh, finite subcover. There's no way of getting a finite subcollection that still covers I. Okay. Okay. Now, uh, divide I into um, uh, two of the K K cells. So divide I. Uh, diadically into two K, K cells. Okay, and by by diadically, I mean that you take every edge, <coughs> you take every interval and divide it in half. Okay, so you take the center of each interval, center of each interval, and then you use those things to make um, two to the K uh, subcells. At least one of those resulting cells uh, uh, cannot be covered by a finite uh, subcover of the G alpha. Right? Right? Because if they if they all could be covered by finite subcovers, that would give you a finite subcover of the original. And we know that there's no finite subcover of the original. Okay. Right? I'll say it again. Right? The whole thing there's no for the whole for the original i. There's no finite subcover, right? Now we divide it into four. For one of these guys, it must be that there's no finite subcover because if there were finite subcovers for each of these things, we'd have a finite subcover for the for the for the original i, and we don't. Okay. Okay. So. Um, uh, And one of those cells, call it I sub 1, call it I sub 1, cannot be covered by the finite subcover of the, of the G alpha, and then iterate. Right? Right, so we take, let's say it's this guy, we call this guy I1, we diagonally divide this guy, and we do the same thing. We choose the one that, for, that doesn't have a finite subcover, maybe it's this guy. Right? We divide that guy, we keep on going, choosing the ones that don't have a finite subcover every time. Okay. So <clears throat> we obtain a sequence of nested K cells, uh, I, sub, uh, I sub N, such that one, um, none of the I N can be covered with a finite subcover of the G of the G alpha, and two, their diameters, the diameters of the IN um, shrink, right? It's going to be 
2 to the negative n times delta. Right, every time you divide by, by 2. So each time you divide by 2. Right? That's, that's all we're saying here. Okay, so I've just spelled out what we said in the picture. Okay. Okay. Well, what am I going to do next? I've got these. I've got these nested cells. Right. Um, they're shrinking. Uh, I know that um, by the previous, by the corollary, which we didn't prove, but was trivial. Um, by the corollary, we know that the intersection of the I n is not empty. Right. Contains some point. Let's call it x star. Okay. If we intersect all these guys. There's somebody in there. Okay. Okay. So here comes the contradiction. You say, well, look, um, uh, x star must lie in some g alpha, right? Let's say, let's call it G alpha naught. Okay. X, uh, X star lies in one of these, one of these G alphas. Okay. Sorry, yeah. I think on the second point, did you mean to say the diagonal code? I, I, it's the diameter. It's the diameter, which is the length of the diagonal. Okay. It's the greatest distance possible in the set. Yeah, sorry, I didn't define. I should have. Diameter which in this case is the length of the, of the diagonal. Okay, so we know that, um, right, right, so we intersected all these guys and we ended up with some point x, x star here, right? And we know that um, the G alphas cover the whole, right? The, the G alphas are an open cover of I, so we know that one of these G alphas covers, G alpha, there's a G alpha nine, that covers that point x star. Okay, all right? And this, this is open, which is open. Okay, and so this is interior to G alpha naught, right? So we know that um, there exists a radius r such that um, the r neighborhood of x star lies inside of G alpha naught. So we know that there's some, 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 some radius around x star that lies inside of g alpha naught. Okay. But now, now, choose n large enough that, so here is our x star, and we know that there's some radius r that lies inside of the G alpha. Okay, that lies inside of the G alpha. Okay, but now choose n large enough that two to the minus n delta is less than r. Right? Two to the minus n alpha is less than r. Right? Then, I sub n, right? Uh, I sub n is contained in that R neighborhood of, of X star, which is contained in G alpha naught. Right? Right, remember what X star is. X star is the intersection of the I sub n's, right? Of the I's, right? So you choose, you choose what, you say, well, let's go far enough down that we're gonna, we're, uh, the, the, the diameter of, of the guy is smaller than r, right? The diameter of the guy is smaller than r, well that means that, that, that I sub n must not lie inside of, lie inside of this, this, uh, this neighborhood, but that makes the I sub n lie inside of g alpha naught. That's a contradiction, right? Because we've just covered the I sub n with a single g alpha naught where we said that none of the i sub n with, can be covered with a finite number of the, of the g alphas, right? The, the, the i sub n were chosen so that 
you know, you can't cover them, they, none of them can be covered with a finite sum cover of the G alphas, right? But here we found a single one that actually covers the, the eyes of them, so that's a contradiction. Say it again. Okay. We can, we'll, let's, let's sketch it again. We're trying to show this guy's not compact. So we know that there's a bad open cover for which there's no finite subcover. We divide I into, into subcells, right? One of them uh, must have the property that there's no finite subcover, right? We divide that guy into subcells. One of them must have the property that there is no finite subcover for that guy. We keep on going. Oops. We keep on going. We take those guys and intersect them all, we get this point x star. Okay, we get this point x star. Um, x star uh, is just a single point, right? It lies, it must lie in one of the elements of the cover, right? But the cover is open, right? So that means it lies inside of some ball inside of the cover, right? But the I sub n's are shrinking down to, down to zero, right? Their diameters are shrinking down to zero. So just go far enough down that you've got the I sub n that lies inside of that ball, right? Lies inside of that ball, but that means it's covered by that ball. Contradiction, because none of the I sub n's were supposed to be covered by a finite number of sets, let alone one. Yeah? So How do we know that x star lies in some g alpha norm? Well, x star lies in, in I, right? And the g alphas are cover of I, right? You have an open cover of I, you have an open cover of the whole original set, right? Mm -hmm. And X, X star lies in the intersection of these guys. In particular, it lies inside of the original one, right? So you've got the G, G, G alphas, right? They cover the, the whole original uh, 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 K cell, right? And so they cover X star also. Any questions? Yeah, Miss. So, um, like, I think we say that when we divide it one time, there is like just one of the like sub, like the cells, cells yeah. that is like included in the I N. Yeah. So, yeah. if there are, can there be more? There can be more. So, just choose one of them, right? At least one of these K cells. Call it. Uh, choose one. Call it the next guy, right? Okay. It doesn't, there may be more, but that doesn't, that we don't, we don't need them. Yeah. Okay. Is the product of two closed and like sets or intervals also closed? Uh, because I feel like I is, we define as the product of like A1, B1 with A2, B2, yeah. and the both are closed. Yeah, Are we so assuming that's enough? Like it, it is. It is closed, right? Um, I mean, this is this is just uh, right. You can you can prove that a case cell is you can prove that a case yeah, cell is closed. But I was saying, could we just do it with the product, the construction? Um, is that true? Is that true? Let me think about it. Cause I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. I, I think that's true, but I forgot. I haven't thought about it in a while. I should give you a point for coming up with something like that, <laughs> that I can't ask. But then everybody wants to start doing it. <laughs> I don't want to encourage you to do that. Maybe I should. Okay. Okay. Um, Heine Burrell. Okay. So, in Euclidean space, the following are equivalent. The following are equivalent. One, uh, so you have some subset E in your Euclidean space. Um, e is closed and bounded. It is equivalent to E is compact. It is equivalent to E is limit point compact. So we 
we already showed contact <coughs> implies limit point contact. Right? We already showed B implies C. We have just shown, in fact, that closed and bounded implies compact. In some sense. I mean, we've, we've just <coughs> made it trivial to show it. It's a proof of <coughs> A implies B. You say, well, look, if B is closed and bounded, uh, let me say closed and bounded, then E lies inside some 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 K cell. Right? If it's bounded, it lies inside some K cell, which is compact. By what we just by the proof we just gave. Right? But then you're a closed subset of a compact set, so you're compact. Since E is closed, it's compact. So AB, A implies B, is easy after the long argument we just gave. Um, B implies C is actually easy. Um, and what's left is to show that C implies A. That limit point compactness implies closed and bounded. <coughs> okay. So C implies A. You say, well, um, so assume E is limit point compact. And suppose E is not bounded. OK. But if E is not bounded, then it's easy to construct um, <coughs> an infinite set. with no limit point. Right? Because not bounded means that whatever ball I take, there's somebody on the outside. Right? So I take a ball of you know, some fixed radius. Um, right? I take a ball of some fixed radius, uh, you know, one, say. I know that there's some E1, E1 sitting outside of here, right? And then I say, okay, now I'm going to take another ball of, say, double the distance to, to E1, right? Double, I take the, double the distance to E1. I know that there's some E2 sitting outside there, right? There's going to be some point E2 sitting outside there because E is not bounded, right? And you just keep on going in this way, and you construct this infinite set. It's got no limit point. So the way you're defining E1 and E2 are they the limit points? No, no, no. I'm constructing a set that has no limit points. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, however you want to do it, it's not it's not difficult to construct. Yeah. Okay. Um, okay. The slightly uh, harder one is to say so. So we know that E must be bound. Suppose. E is not closed. Okay. In other words, it doesn't contain all its limit points, right? So, i.e., there exists um, an x not uh, a, a limit point x not of E that is not contained in E. Right. It's contained in the complement. Okay. So there's a limit point of E that's not con not not contained in E itself. Okay. So okay. So there's this guy x not in E complement. Okay. But then. We're going to get a contradiction with limit point compactness. Okay, how are we going to do it? We said, well, look, right? For every, um, uh, we're going to 
remember what it means to be a limit point for every punctured every punctured neighborhood there's somebody in E in that <coughs> punctured neighborhood so we're going to create using that fact a sequence of guys in E that uh, that have x naught as a limit point but x naught is not in E so that contradicts limit point compactness right limit point compactness Limit point compactness means that every infinite subset should have a subset, should have a limit point in E. But this limit point is going to lie outside of E, and that, that's the contradiction. Okay, so let's 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 make it at three minutes, should be enough. Um, okay, so this is limit point that lies in the complement, um, then for all n in the natural numbers. Um, we know that there exists an E sub n that lies in um, the punctured neighborhood of x naught of radius 1 over n intersect E. Okay, so we look at the neighborhoods of radii 1, 1 half, 1 third, Etc. Etc. One half, one third, one fourth, etc. Etc. Okay. Those guys, and we say, well, that could, since e, since x naught is a limit point, there's got to be somebody in that punctured neighborhood that lies in E. Okay. Um, then uh, this set is an infinite set. Uh, infinite subset of E um, with X which is not in E as its limit point. Right? So you've got this infinite subset, but um, and X is X is the limit point of it, but um, uh, Um, but so you've got this infinite subset and x is its limit point but x doesn't lie in E okay, okay. Now, I, I do need to say one more thing um, before somebody corrects me okay you, you, might, you might ask why can't some other point be a limit point of s. Why can't some other point be a limit point of s? Right? It's clear that x naught is a limit point of s, but that doesn't rule out that there might be some other limit point of s. Right? Okay. You say, well, okay. Um, uh, suppose uh, let y be any other point. Let y be any other point in your set. Then by the triangle inequality, by the triangle inequality, um, the distance from E sub n to y is bigger than or equal to um, the distance from x naught to y minus the distance from x naught to e, e sub n. Okay, so this is the, the other side of the triangle inequality. Okay. Okay. Um, Now, I know that this thing, the distance from x naught to e sub n, this thing is smaller than 1 over n, right? Because e sub n lay in the, in the radi guy with radius 1 over n, right? So I'm going to subtract off something bigger. I get this is bigger than this minus 1 over n. <coughs> Large enough that 
one over n, um, that that uh, this thing minus one over n is greater than uh, a half of the distance from x naught to y. Right. In other words, such that one over n is smaller than half the distance from x naught to y. Okay. That tells us that the distance from <coughs> e n to y is eventually bigger than or equal to one half some constant distance. Sorry to rush through this. Um, the distance from E n to what do we what what do we get? We get that um, here is our x naught. We're saying that this guy is a limit point. Why can't anybody else be a limit point? Well, because if we choose anybody else, eventually everybody gets close to x naught, right? Everybody gets close to x naught, and so they get far away from y. Right? They get farther than half the distance. They get farther than half the distance to, to x naught. Right? This is, I, I should have drawn this picture. Right? Everybody gets close to close to x naught, and so there could only be finitely many guys near y. Y could not be a limit point if there's only finitely many guys near it. Okay. 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 That's it. So. Um, so. Uh, so. Um, if you're. So it, it so he has to be closed, right? So so he has to be closed. So he must be closed. Okay. Okay, that's it.